Ontology, the Waystation of Red-Pilled Sanity Written by William Leo Translated by Deep L and a Human Read for you by Ginny, Arya and Guy All Bots the final results of China's seventh national census have not yet been unveiled and the release date has been pushed back time and again. It seems that the truthful population figure of communist-ruled mainland China has become a mystery. But certain local population information has already appeared in the media. Rather surprisingly, five cities in coastal Jiangsu province, economically the richest province in China, have joined in the ranks of negative natural population growth. It can also be seen that the number of first marriages, as well as the number of newborn births in various regions, have declined significantly. So, William, my question is, if China is indeed experiencing both natural population depletion and aging, what are the eventual long-term consequences of this trend? In fact, there is no way for the population policy to succeed because no one can really manage the population, only to go along with it or accept it as a fait accompli. The destructive effect of communism on population is mainly reflected in the destruction of pluralism. Normally, the demographic structure is not embodied in the larger society, but in small communities. There are always various small groups in society, whose fertility rate always varies and can complement each other. Only a communist state can annihilate all its small communities and make the ecology very homogeneous. No one but the state apparatus could constitute a quasi-aristocratic class. And the fertility rate of the salaried civil servants of the state institutions is particularly low, acting as a negative role model. Communism, I mean, Leninism, not Marxism, to be precise, is theoretically a takeover program, accelerating those societies that lag behind the West to catch up with it. But in practice, the acceleration always brings those societies into an aging society prematurely, while the economic development level fails to catch up. It removes the fundamental incentive to have children. For example, when you have a child, you can't educate it according to your own will, but to that of the state, and the result of that type of education may be a kid who would grow up to break three of your ribs. Translators note. The former high-ranking Chinese Communist Party official, one of the many princelings of children of senior party officials, the Bo Xilai is said to have broken the ribs of his own father, the veteran communist leader Bo Weiba, in a violent confrontation during the Cultural Revolution. And when you reach the age of a pensioner, the amount you get will have nothing to do with the number of children you have raised. Instead, everyone receives his pension, and other people's children will have to pay for your pension. In this scenario the more children you have, the less cost-effective it must be for you. In places like Manchurian state enterprises, this mindset is most pronounced. Within two or three generations, people's behavior patterns will experience a complete flip and they won't have children at all. Besides, the Manchurians' pension funds are kept afloat through the nationwide transfer payment thanks to the industrial shift created by the large number of migrant workers from the southeast coast which is no longer sustainable as the Yangtze River Delta and Pearl River Delta populations are depleted. We should note that now the U.S. auto companies and German engine companies are opening factories in central and western China, in Sichuan and Guangxi. The reason is that the population of the coastal areas has basically dried up. The industries that are shifting fastest, like textiles and things like that, move to places like the Bangladesh Delta where the population is still abundant. Therefore, China, because of its sheer size, actually has a Hitlerian problem. The reason Hitler forbade his soldiers to fall back on the Moscow front was because there was no better position to fall back to than the front. To retreat would only serve to prove the commander-in-chief wrong and undermine the resolve of the troops. He would rather stick to the end and insist that he was correct. If we lost, it's because these frontline soldiers couldn't appreciate the leadership's wisdom. Therefore you must hang on there. If changing the policy can get better results, then it is okay to change the policy. If changing the policy does not work at all, you might as well stick to it and insist that you have been absolutely right from the very beginning.
Thus you can at least preserve the prestige. Preserving prestige is a very important thing, and in China's case, it is clear that only prestige can be preserved. If we were to shift the policy from population control to population promotion, it would not only be too late now, it would have been too late even 10 years ago. The fertility rate is dependent on the female population between the ages of 20 and 25. After this demographic base is slashed off, no policy will work. In all fairness, the realistic point of time to change the policy should have been around the year 1997. It would have been a bit too late in 2007. After 2007 it would make no difference whether to make a U-turn or not. Because the population of women of childbearing age had fallen all the way down, there is no reason or force to turn it back around. Thanks to the ruthless effectiveness of the state apparatus for social stability maintenance, when the elderly in rural areas committed suicide, people did not hear about it at all, and by the time the news slowly leaked out, it was already 2012, 10 years ago, when the wave of population decline was approaching the small cities. When I used to visit my hometown Zhejiang, a small city in central China, no young people left in Zhejiang at that time. But the population in Chengdu, a large city in the same province, still appeared quite young, while the population in Shenzhen, a huge coastal city, was extremely young. Now, the wave of people under 40 disappearing has reached coastal cities like Wuxi. Further down the line, even Shenzhen and Guangzhou are not getting nourished by new blood. Dongguan became the manufacturing capital because the social structures of Hunan and Guangdong were smashed to pieces after Mao Zedong came to power, so the isolated individuals like random atoms with no connection or protection had no other choice but to gravitate towards wherever there was money to be earned. And the money gave them but illusory satisfaction. Those who could only buy homemade cloth can now afford imported goods. But their life, and most importantly their class status itself, has never changed. Those consumer goods serve the same purpose as electronic opium, to make you temporarily anesthetize yourself in your leisure time and feel that your life has changed for the better. In fact, for example, you are in the same situation as you were in 1978 when you could not afford any imported products from Hong Kong and had no work to do, compared to the secretary of the village party committee, to the police station chief in Dongguan, or to everyone else in society. You mistakenly thought your status had improved, but it hadn't. The result of such mobility is to create an illusion that you will not take any action during that critical period when you might otherwise change your own personal choices. Then after that window of opportunity is closed, your path is locked in. From the state's point of view, this approach helped turn the population that would have become riotous rebels into a compliant foreign currency earning labor force who, when old and no longer able to rebel or make trouble, would die a quiet death. This purpose has largely been achieved. Now the era of 50-year-old migrant workers is upon us. No industries can rely on cheap labor to sustain themselves as they did 20 years ago. Opening factories in Sichuan and Guangxi is but a stopgap measure to survive. The remaining resort is to redesign the education system, reform the employment system, restructure the household registration system, and finally reintroduce the labor army quota system. Students with bad grades in junior high school are directly sent to vocational schools by the state compulsory power. Such vocational schools are not unlike those Uyghur concentration camps where the apprentices will lose their freedom of choice, but to work for businesses in contract with those schools. That's the only way to maintain the labor force. There is no other way. What was the foundation of the so-called socialist market economy proposed by Deng Xiaoping and others in 1992? It was the availability of a large population of fluid migrants then which enabled easy recruitment of laborers. Back then, Guangzhou Railway Station as an extremely chaotic and overcrowded hub for migrants was the embodiment of the spirit of the socialist market economy. When labor is in short supply and the price of labor can't rise, the only possible solution is forced labor. According to the kind of socialist market economy that was implemented in the 90s, it is reasonable to infer that by the time labor is in short supply, 
the price of labor will have to go up. However, higher labor prices will destroy the entire industry in China. No power of private enterprise, or the power of any monopolistic combination formed by private enterprise, is sufficient to stay the rise in labor prices, only the state can. The state should restore its institutional superior advantage, starting with educational reform, reintroducing tiered and differentiated management, restoring the original education system where only a very select few elite students could go to college. The main motive behind everyone's desire to go to college is that after going to college, according to the implicit social customary rules, you would no longer work as a blue collar. And doing manual work has become an extremely cruel thing, something only losers would do. The result is that too many college graduates, unable to find a job, keep on studying for more degrees, or do similar things just to carry on. They flood the society like the surplus officials in the late Qing dynasty waiting to be appointed with a position in the government system. But these students do enjoy a privilege they don't have to work. What can be done to eliminate these idle classes who are unwilling to work? Preemptive diversion in the educational system by restoring the former practices and sending most of the population to start working at the junior high school age. This would enable effective and scientifically rational use of the existing working population and maintain China's economic system. Such a reform is already on the horizon, and it is the only way to solve the problem. It won't work to count on fertility. First of all, giving birth to and raising children is a long-term investment, which is a bourgeois philosophy and pursuit. Of course, I use the concept of bourgeoisie often in a relative sense. For example, in places where the feudal tradition is relatively deep and strong, if one would only care about the well-being of one's own generation, that is a proletarian approach. But in fact, in today's China, it is already very bourgeois to take care of one's own long-term happiness, not to mention for as long as one generation, but for merely 10 years from now. 99% of the people only consider the immediate three years or even three months. When told this practice will bring you disaster ten years from now, he will not listen to you at all, and will even dismiss that warning as extremely ridiculous. You can't implement a policy that aims at raising the birth rate now and expects to have a workforce available twenty years from now. Such a policy is unenforceable, both for the government and for the atomized population affected by this policy. An enforceable policy to the Chinese is not one that only promises benefits 20 years from now with complete uncertainty who will reap these benefits. Instead, an enforceable policy is one that integrates existing resources and produces immediate and right-away results, like manufacturing poor quality masks. Only something like that can be implemented in China at this moment. I would have to say that the social situation in China at this moment in time is in a much more pathetic form than it was under Zhao Ziyang in the 1980s or under Jiang Zemin in the 1990s. Contrary to what liberals claim, it's not that China took a detour during the Mao era and has since made a U-turn, and though not to the point where it's as good as a true democracy in the West, despite its political authoritarianism, at least a little bit of economic freedom has been restored. That is not the case. Socially speaking, the timeline for the majority members of society has been ever shrinking. Being concerned about the well being of one's children was still a common mindset in the 1980s. To live one's life to the full without limitation, but caring about the overall happiness for the entirety of one's own life was a prevalent ideology in the 90s. By the 80s and 90s, I mean the age when I went to college. I was shocked when I was made aware of the dominant culture in the early 21st century that as long as there is a bargain in the present decade, even if you are destined to suffer when you retire, and you can't deny that's the case, you still would take the advantage now. I was thinking, if you choose this path in life, you might as well save yourself the trouble and simply do nothing, or do whatever you feel like to since what would the 10 years benefits mean to you? In what form will the population data finally be published is mainly a matter of face, not a matter of fact. The Chinese actually care a lot about face in the bottom of their heart. My estimate is that the fact of negative population growth was leaked to the outside by insiders, costing the party state its face, 
So in a fit of anger they said, Damn, we just don't admit it, we will cook up a new figure to prove that you are all slandering us. But in reality, such figures are no longer relevant. The program to deal with the issue is already set on the string and ready to be implemented. Starting with the education system, matching the labor management system, a mandatory vocational education and training system has been introduced. Note that the system is the same as that vocational education and training system for the Uyghurs, which amounts to a pilot project. The Communist Party would cry, you guys are calling that a concentration camp? No way. Persecution of minorities? How can you say we are persecuting the majority of the nation's ethnic groups when the majority of our people are about to receive the same treatment? This is genocide? We genocide ourselves? Slander, slander, you imperialists lie so shamelessly. This is vocational education. Why do we have vocational education for Uyghurs? Damn, these Muslims practice a barbarian religion, and they are backward-minded like the Thais and Malaysians. They think that instead of buying any imported products, it's just about okay to use a native silk product like Edelweiss silk for their women to use at their wedding. The most important thing to them is to let that woman get married in time to have two or three children. After she has had two or three children, she would devote herself to bringing up her children and refuse to go out to work. Nor does she want to buy any imported designer clothes or anything like that, therefore she doesn't feel the need to work. Then her children have two or three more children, and they wouldn't leave their hometown to work. What a waste of valuable labor force, and we are in shortage of labor force. What's the root of this problem? It must be because your imams and religious figures have instilled in them backward thinking, making them wrongly think that family is more important than jobs, more important than money, more important than anything. This is how the CCP thinks. So far the solution has been to blaze the path with Leninism and bolstered up with consumerism to ensure the principle of random atom-like disconnection and isolation permeate down to each and every individual in the society. And this thorough disorganization of the individuals is the key to China's economic miracle and China's foreign exchange reserves, which must never be undermined. China would have no way to sail its two aircraft carriers, the Liaoning and Shandong carriers if there were no textile exports. Therefore, the system that keeps young female migrant workers from the impoverished south-central part of the Chinese mainland toiling in textile factories in the affluent special zone of Guangdong or masks factories in coastal Zhejiang province is the lifeblood of the party state and can never be touched. Therefore, these women cannot be allowed to go home to have children. Their not having children will have serious consequences in the future, their having children will have serious consequences right now. Yet the serious consequences in the present are more grave than the serious consequences in the future, which is why the former is absolutely unacceptable. We have another way to use the labor force more wisely. That way is to put use to half, even more than half, of the high school students who are now idle, and that problem can be solved for three or five years for now. The relevant policies are already in place and are being implemented. Soon you can witness that half of the junior high school students are diverted to vocational institutes, where they are in reality apprentices, working and training effectively as low-wage workers to fill the void of cheap labor. Well, thank you very much William for your answer. In your opinion, the demographic composition of China is irreversibly going down a slope. The main reason is that they themselves succeeded in reducing the number of women of childbearing age in the last century so no policies are going to salvage them. They can only take an involuted approach as illustrated by you to solve the immediate problem without thinking about the future. Thank you for listening. This is a podcast series produced by Luminous Society. Luminous Society provides you with an alternative historical narrative.